just some background and information about us. We met in 2020. Uh, none of us really knew each other, but we were all kind of seeking the same thing, which was to continue learning um, about art to find community. And most of us had not done murals before, so once we came together, we, will, we were able to learn a lot from each other and together as a team. Um, since then, we've done 10 or more murals in the Monterey Bay area, um, and we're continuing to, continue to learn and grow together. So let's get into it. Okay, so step one, review criteria. What are your qualifications? Uh, typically, the first thing you're going to do is you're going to read the RFQ. Uh, what do they require, the, the client that wants to hire you for the project or the call for artists? Um, what is their budget? You want to look at that. Uh, how much energy and time are you willing to spend? Depending on their budget, but also know your worth. You, typically, we have a base rate for us uh, as far as square footage goes. Um, and, uh, and timing, when do they want this project done? Um, how long do you think it's going to take you to paint this, paint this project or get it done? And uh, every project is different. Every project requires different qualifications. Some will require insurance. Some not, some will require permits. Um, so yeah, there's there's a lot of different details in that. Um, also, uh, review your past experience. Uh, what, you know, uh, can you get this done? Can our team get this done? Uh, what are our skills uh, to do to do this project? Uh, so yeah, so see their budget, account for travel costs. Um, is this project in another city? Uh, what's, yeah, what's the, the accommodations? Uh, and know your resources. Uh, networking, uh, have that in mind. Who do you know that can help you with this project if there is a, let's say, community paint day like that we, I had in uh, Sacramento or a community engagement event? Uh, so know your resources uh, because there requires a lot of organization and a lot of networking with people to help you get it done. Uh, now, step two, deciding. Uh, what it comes to deciding uh, if a project is right for you, uh, there is a certain criteria that you have to meet. Uh, this is a personal criteria, of course, uh, that has to do with what your personal goals and your and your ideals are. But a few questions to think about um, when deciding if something if a project is right for you is uh, if this project causes you any type of inspiration. Uh, you have to question your your motives to want to do this, your motivation, and like I said, if it aligns with your values and your goals. Us as a team of five, uh, you can imagine that there's a lot of heads, a lot of ideas. So uh, we basically narrow it down to, well not narrow it down, but mostly the question we ask ourselves is, will this project elevate the community? And uh, you might find that sometimes projects can be really exciting and you're just like, oh, I wanna do it, but it's not for you, you know? So these things happen, but ultimately, when you decide that you are all ready to go all in, then you have to be ready to put in all the work and to push through all the obstacles that come your way. Next step is you have to actually visit the site. Um, this is super important to me specifically when you're getting an RFQ for a design and want your proposal, they'll give you like dimensions and to me, that doesn't really do justice. You have to actually get there, see the wall, really get a feel for it. I literally love going, touching the wall, knowing the surface. Um, for me, painting with my hands, like even if I'm painting with spray cans or whatever, I'm always using my hands to, to, to put the paint on. So texture is super important with the wall. You need to, you know, painting on cement or wood or metal, it's all different. And you gotta be prepared for uh, knowing how to work with that surface. Um, then you gotta think about the environment. Uh, is it outside or is it inside? What's the weather like at the time of year that you're gonna be painting? Like that's all super critical to knowing what you're gonna have to need to, to uh, get the project done. And then lastly, uh, you really should take some time to get to know the community around which you're gonna be painting. Like that's super important to to connect with the people. They're gonna be uh, protecting, enjoying your mural long after you're gone. So if you can uh, connect with them, 
Like me personally, I've done it where even the a lot of public murals, you know, there'll be like the homeless population that is around there. I connect with those people because they're the ones that are literally going to be there watching over your wall. So it, it's cool to make sure and connect with everyone of all walks of life. Uh, that's the beauty of public art is for everyone. So definitely connect with the community. So after that, step four is now you get to go and brainstorm, start breaking it down, figure out. And just so y'all know, that's Avelino right there. That's not just a team member. Uh, he's the oldest of us, but he's got the youngest spirit. So, uh, so yeah, now we start brainstorming. Uh, now it's time to start thinking of a theme, concepts for your wall. Start putting it together in your mind. Uh, this this part of it takes a lot of research. Uh, definitely, if you have an idea, take the time to, to do some research, go online, figure out if there's little nuggets you can find about, you know, whatever theme you're going for, you can find symbols, ideas, uh, just by doing a little research, figuring out uh, what's behind it to that. And then make sure that it's in context with the community, with whatever the RFQ is asking for, make sure that you're uh, following all the bullet points and uh, yeah. So the next step is the fun stuff, which is the creative session and design work. Um, so pretty much you're taking everything from the brainstorm and breakdown and you're creating an objective, which is the message you want the mural to deliver. And once you have that objective, you use like the style, color palette, symbols and representation to deliver that message. Um, one thing is that in a team of five or however big your team is, you're gonna have multiple perspectives and interpretations, so it's important to combine all of those pers perspectives and create a singular vision and then stick to it. Um, another thing is that the creative session, the mock-up, has several phases uh, for us specifically we kind of all get together in one room for that first step, um, which is, you know, the line work, the composition, uh, deciding what, you know, symbols and um, images that you're gonna be working with. And then once you decide on that, you know, initial foundational structure of the image, we move in, into bringing in color, and then you have color and the structure, and then throughout the process, you're gonna, add things, you're gonna take it away, and then you'll get to a somewhat final mock-up, and then you'll look at it again, and you'll say, actually, I wanna do another change. So there's usually around like two or three like final mock-ups until you actually have the real final mock-up. Um, so be patient. Yeah. Step six, execution and breakdown. What is needed to make this happen? How are you getting this done logistically for the client? Um, how much equipment do you need? Do you have paint left over from a past project? Uh, what do you, do you have enough tarps, uh, scaffolding, lifts, uh, shipping containers if you need space? Uh, are they going to accommodate for, let's say, they have to close the street down if you know if there's a narrow sidewalk or uh, yeah, space for a boom lift or or things like that? Um, how long will it take you to get it done? Two to three weeks. You got to relay that to them. Be clear and concise with your timeline. Uh, assignments, uh, we generally assign assignments to get quotes for budgeting and uh, on different things that we will need and relay the cost to the, the client. Uh, organizing, uh, this in particular has been probably 50% of our work uh, with the community engagement events that we're doing, in particular for this project uh, at the Al South Center for the Arts. Uh, it you know, requires uh, communicating with vendors with the venue. We're showcasing some local artists their work as well, telling stories, poets, uh, music. Uh, so yeah, there's a lot of organizing involved. And uh, and accommodations, yes, uh, what, uh, what do you need when you're actually painting on the wall? What, what, do, what does the client need to do that make you feel comfortable with and help you uh, work uh, efficiently? Um, so the next step is kind of what matters to the client most, which is how their budget for the project is going to they, they're going to want to see receipts, so that means getting quotes for equipment rentals, getting quotes from paint companies, 
for the uh, materials you're going to be using, um, and then also describing your labor costs. You yourself are going to want to know the labor costs for yourself for this project. Um, how much do you want to make that is makes the project worth it for you, um, while also you know being reasonable to the client. Um, and you got to keep in mind size of the mural, uh, the materials you're working with, the environment, um, and then you have to consider the time and energy you've already invested in this proposal, and the time and energy and skill you've developed, um, you know, throughout the years as an artist. Those are things that uh, merit work. Um, and then you're going to create a kind of spreadsheet of, you know, an itemized list of every single cost um, in the description of why it's there. Um, it's, you want to be detailed and clear about how the client's money is being used. Uh, and along with that, uh, step eight here is to create a timeline. Um, we as a group like to create a timeline because if you're an artist like I am, time means nothing. So it's just a really good way to keep us focused. Uh, and on task on top of what we need to do. Everything from, uh, you know, when our contracts are gonna be signed, to when we're gonna get the materials and, and equipment, to, you know, when we're presenting final mock-ups. Um, it's crucial for us to stay uh, on top of what we, what we need to do. And these are mostly for, for our timeline, because usually just set, uh, set uh, like, we just set the ideal dates. This, uh, this is not written in stone. Um, it, things can change at any, at any given time. Uh, nothing is, you know, it's just, it's just good for you to stay focused. And also it provides your, uh, the person who's paying for this mural, it also provides them that you have a plan, you know, ju you, just like with the budget, if you're very structured with it, it, it also shows the people that you're working for or with that you have a plan and this is, you know, step by step. It's not so much about like, uh, Sticking to it, oh yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. It's not. It's not. It's not so much. It's just like, oh, this is what it has to be. It's just. It's just the sequence. It's just one of the sequence of events that we have to follow through to see this project through, basically. Um, so step nine is make a presentation. So you want to be able to provide a, you know, visuals, and you want to be able to present your project in a, in a professional way to demonstrate that you're professional, not only in the artistic sense, but in the business sense. Um, you want to make sure that the presentation is clear and concise, informative, and you want to be able to share your mural design, the process of how you got to that design, and the process of what it's going to take to get that mural up on the wall. And just in case any of you don't know, uh, that's our sixth member of our team right there. <laughs> with the information. Uh, you don't want to bore people in a panel with your presentation, so you want to make sure you practice it so that you can get all the ums and all that out of there so that you can just get the information out. And confidence is so important. Uh, make sure that you come off as knowing what you're talking about. Uh, super, super important. And now we just have a few tips for all of y'all out there who are trying to get into this crazy world of mirroring. Um, first and foremost, uh, we like to use action words. Uh, this is, uh, so not, not just in our uh, proposal, but also just among ourselves. Using words like, I will do this instead of I would do this, helps tremendously, even just like in your psyche, just getting you ready to yeah. Stay informed. Make sure that you stay up to date with changes that are happening with RFQs, uh, with proposals, and they're always changing. So you, they won't even tell you that it's changing. So you make sure that you stay up to date and you're always checking in. Um, and also with the community that you're working with, always stay up to date with them. Uh, 
Um, methods of communication are super important, especially when you're working with five people. So anything you can use, uh, IG messaging or Instagram messaging, emails, Zoom, uh, since we all, we can always just meet physically, and uh, even just Google Drive to be able to share important documents, images, all that jazz. Stay flexible. Uh, like I was saying, things change a lot with these things, so you just make sure and be very flexible with your time. Don't get too set on oh, I'm gonna do this when this happens because especially on bigger projects, you're dealing with a lot of entities, a lot of things will be moving, so don't get stressed out if things change on you. You just gotta be able to be flexible. That being said, when it comes to your vision, as artists, that is the most important thing is stay true to your vision. Because there's so many moving parts, it's very easy to get lost in that and then to lose your vision and get you know, let other people start guiding you on, on what you should do, but you're the artist, so make sure you stay true to that. That will take you a long way in this game, is, is really believing in yourself. Uh, you also gotta evaluate your strengths as individuals and as a team. Uh, we like to do this by not just, uh, we, we have creative sessions where we all get together and paint or draw or, you know, but also, um, but also we, we do extracurricular things like going out for like bonding camp, camping trips or just like having uh, movie nights where we really get to know each other so we can, because murals is not just placing, as you can see, it's not just placing an image on the wall. It's, it's really knowing your strengths and that comes from everyday life tasks. So that's... Good camaraderie. Yeah. And then be confident. Um, like I mentioned before, confidence will go a long way, especially in the proposal uh, part of it. You want the people that you're gonna be working with to feel confident in you, that you're gonna get the job done. And to do that, you gotta really present yourself in a very confident manner. Um, but that being said, also be humble, because you, know, you could apply for 20, 30 proposals, and you may only get one. Um, so there's gonna be a lot of rejection in this game. Uh, but that one will make up for those 19 rejections. You know, getting that one project is, makes everything else not matter. So, but keep that humbleness. And uh, just a few things uh, to have prepared always and uh, regularly updated uh, is to have your resume or your curriculum be uh, a portfolio of all your past work, a short bio yourself just to really introduce who you are to people who don't know anything about you and uh, uh, a website or social media established is also a great idea. I mean, we live in a technological age, so, you know, it's just easier, easier to have these ready for you if you want to use them. Okay, so that almost wraps it up. Uh, this just to summarize uh, everything that we talked about today. Uh, review criteria, uh, what, are they, what are they looking for uh, based on, let's say, your past experience or your your current experience. Um, step two, deciding is this project right for your team or you individually. Uh, know your space, uh, yeah, analyze the wall. Uh, yeah, uh, are there accommodations? I mean, see the terrain, are you gonna need scaffolding or lifts? Uh, brainstorm breakdown, uh, analyze the theme, do historical research. Uh, always stay uh, on the context, stay informed on the context of this, uh, of a particular project. Uh, creative session design, share ideas, you know, come together as one unified group and stay true to that theme. Uh, and uh, execution breakdown, how are you gonna get it done logistically? You know, the equipment, the organizing, accommodations, budgeting, uh, account for every every cost, uh, you know, travel and, and materials and labor. Uh, building a timeline, stay on schedule, but uh, be flexible as well because there, there will be a lot of changes and some setbacks, but stay motivated and excited about the project. Uh, that, that, yeah, so practice, make a presentation, make it cute. Uh, everybody loves visuals. Uh, that's the first thing they look at because you are an artist, so you know, use your illustrator skills to make a nice PowerPoint to present it. Um, and practice builds confidence, and prep work makes a dream work.
So thank you very much. Nice to meet you. If you look me up, uh, it's Timothy Robert Smith. I have to use my middle name because Tim Smith is like such a common name. Uh, so that narrows it down a little bit. But you can call me Tim. Um, I'll just do a quick little presentation of like what I do, and then I'll switch it over to what you can do uh, to apply for murals. That's me. I do stuff all over the world. Um, I just got back from Canada recently. Uh, I've done stuff in uh, Japan, but mostly the United States. This is Hermosa Beach. That's Wilmington. And I do really large scale uh, mural projects. Um, I, I got my start as a gallery artist, actually. Uh, so I was doing smaller work, and that's how I developed my style. I call my style multidimensionalism, and basically it's about multiple dimensions combining together, um, and kind of like glitches in the fabric of time and space. But mostly what it's about is perspective. So it's like seeing things from different angles, different viewpoints. I have a lot of extreme, like worm's eye and bird's eye, and I like to paint on the ceiling so it has this kind of 3D effect. Uh, I do realism, so uh, it's not necessarily photorealism because it's stylized, but I use photo references and I try to make it as, as accurate as possible. Um, this is in Canada. The shoe here kind of wraps around, so when you walk it has this like moving effect to it. And then the shoe is like huge, so there's a lot of foreshortening in, in my work, a lot of like um, objects that kind of fade into the background and then come into the foreground in dramatic ways. Uh, this is also from 2022. Uh, this is in Laguna Beach. I, I teach a mural class in Laguna Beach, California. Um, and I do the designs and my students uh, help paint it. This is in Las Vegas. And this is Kinston, North Carolina. So yeah, this is, a, this is a photo reference that I took. This is in Wilmington. Um, and you can see what the photo looks like and then what the painting looks like. So there's, there's a lot of difference when it goes to the painting. You can see some brush strokes. And I do everything with brushes too. Like I tried spray paint. Um, for me, I just wasn't that good at it because um, I was trained in like brush work and, and realism on a small scale. So I converted that to like a large scale. And that's what I do today is like brush work. Uh, oh yeah, here, this is a photo that I took and then this is a small scale mock-up. So it's like a little study painting. And then this is the mural. This is in Toledo, Ohio, and there's big tunnels. Sometimes I do a uh, actual painted version of the mural. Uh, sometimes I do that for a proposal, if I have time. Um, or if the project is really big, even after I get the project, I'll still do uh, a mock painting or a study painting just to help me, to help me understand the colors and the fades and the mixing, so when I get there, I know what I'm doing, and there's no messing around. This is my gallery work. Um, these are pretty big paintings, like they're oil paintings. I think this one's like three by four feet. Uh, but yeah, that's how I got my style. I, I use a lot of Photoshop uh, collages for references. And I had this, uh, this guy who was uh, supporting my work, he was the co-founder of Juxtapose Magazine. Um, and I thought that w was my career path, was being a gallery artist. Um, and then he had this uh, unfortunate death and I was lost for about a year. And then I found Neuralene like right after that. So it was a good time to convert like the style that I've been developing um, and then just do it large scale. Like I, I met up with this mural crew in LA with some friends and we started doing stuff like spray paint, stencil and some brushwork. And then I fell in love with like the immediacy of it and how large it is and how many people see it and interacting with the community. And I'm like, okay, this is what I want to do. So I still do gallery stuff, but mostly I do large oil paintings. That's juxtaposed. Uh, and yeah, these are some of the first murals that I did. Like this is all like stencil, uh, spray painting stuff. This is Circus of Books in Silver Lake. And I did this with a crew of like probably four friends, maybe five. Electrical boxes. That's a, this is a really good way to get started. So this is the first time I ever got paid to do murals. And electrical boxes are not as hard to get 
as like larger walls. Um, a lot of students have them. I don't know if there's any up here, but usually there's a competition and they usually pay $500 to $2,000. That, um, that's what I found. Um, so yeah, I've done a lot of boxes. Here's a few of them. And it was a first mural experience and they're really fun. Um, and then I went to Art Supply Warehouse. That's in, I uh, uh, can't think of the name of the city right now, but it's close to Los Angeles. And this mural I did for free because I didn't have any large walls and I wanted something for my portfolio. Uh, you see there's a night nice piece there for the awesome artists that I really like. Um, but they had this blank space here, this really big canvas, and there's a parking lot here, and a lot of people go to this art supply uh, place, art supply warehouse. So I thought it would be great publicity for me to have a piece up there. So I just talked to the managers, and I ended up getting free paint. Like they know this uh, company, Amsterdam Acrylics, that supports artists. So they connected me with them. And I got like $500 of free paint. I used like half of it. But basically I did this for free um, to get a good photo and to add to my portfolio. And I'm really happy that I did it. Um, and then I started doing other stuff that I got paid for, but I had a proposal um, that I would just create and I would, I would do a cold call sometimes. Like this is Laguna Beach High School. So I, I, I teach in uh, Laguna Beach at the college, so I know a few people there. So I just started asking around, and I'd see a wall, and I'd be like, hey, this is a cool place for a mural. So Laguna Beach High School, like, they kind of wanted something, but they weren't sure. So I just showed them my portfolio, and then just gave them a price, and then I ended up getting to do this wall. Um, this was, then there was like big scaffolding, and yeah, this took uh, a couple weeks to do. This is in Laguna Beach at the college. Yeah, so that's how I got my start. So here's some tips. So applying for jobs, um, there's two different types of jobs that you'll see online. There's an RFQ and an RFP. RFQ is basically just images of your past work and statements. An RFP, they actually make you do a proposal without getting paid for it. Um, RFPs, uh, sometimes it's, it, it's bad to do that because you're basically working for free and everyone's working for free and then they just pick one artist that they like the proposal for it. Uh, but sometimes it's good to do an RFP if you don't have good qualifications. Like if you haven't done a lot of murals and you see jobs out there that are asking for a proposal, you might actually have a better chance because you're not competing with a bunch of people that have these high qualifications. I mean, maybe you are, but an RFQ, um, that's just your qualifications. There's no opportunity to really show what your design is going to be. Um, but I, I still do both, and you can find all these, write this down, callforentries.org. That's like the main site right there. Um, yeah, cafe, or callforentries.org, and then publicartist.org is another good one. And Code of Works is pretty cool. They, they have stuff, but those are the three sites um, that I use. Sometimes specific states will have like their own site. So you could, you could do like deep dive researches about what's out there, but this is where you get started. That's the main place to find um, all of these job opportunities. So let's talk about requests for qualifications. Oh yeah, did everyone get that down? You already done, all right. That's super important. So, request for qualifications. The most important thing is your portfolio. I've talked to a lot of people that are on the other side of this game, where they're the ones deciding, and definitely the images are so important. The narrative and your experience and all that is important too, but I think like when people just, like, like we're, we're, we're visual people, especially if you're, if you're working in art. Um, people wanna see really high quality images Get yourself a good camera. If you don't have one, borrow one, or buy one and take it back. <laughs> like whatever you gotta do, just get the best photos that you can. Um, even if you don't have any public art yet, take good photos of your studio work and that will at least be something. Okay, um, and then get an accurate description, a list. You gotta get all this information down as soon as you do um, a painting because you might forget some of this stuff. The title, the dimensions, the year it was created, the materials that you used, and be super specific about that, people really want to know. The location, 
the commissioning agency, who paid for it, the budget, what they paid, and a narrative description. So I've applied for a lot of jobs, and sometimes they ask for all of this information for every image, and they want like 10 to 20 images. So that's a lot of work, that's a lot of information. And if you write it down, like ahead of time, like every time you do a piece, you, you gather this information, then it's just copy and paste, it's super easy. But if you don't have this, and you have to go over these 20 images over the last few years, and remember all this stuff, it's very daunting. So, 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 so get a good list uh, in your portfolio. Now here's an example. This is a piece I did for the Lancaster Museum of Art and History. It's an installation. It's 2D and 3D. So it's like this train station, but you could actually walk into it, and there's lights, and there's video projections in another room, man cans. You can sit in these chairs, and then it turns into like a like a two-dimensional painting. So this is 2D, this is 3D. Anyway, this is a project that I did. And it's very complicated, a lot of stuff is going on, but here's just a simple description here. Artist name, title, it's called Revised Maps of the Present, year completed, 2018, dimensions, 20 feet by 20 feet by 10 feet, material, oil and wood, latex sculpture, sound and video. That was the simplest way that I could describe this really weird thing. Commissioning uh, entity uh, who paid for it? Well, this one was a crowdfunding project, uh, but it was 15000 And the location, it started um, at the Museum of Art and History in Lancaster, and then I moved it. I moved the whole show to the A plus D Design Museum in LA, so it was shown in two different places. But I just wanted to show you this. This is a good way of listing, like, like creating an accurate description of your work. And sometimes um, I submit this as an image, so it's like the image will have the little description box beneath it. I don't always do that. Sometimes it's just the image, and then I put the description like on a website or in another list. Everyone has very specific requirements for what they want to see when you uh, when you apply for jobs. Okay. So that's just the first part. That's part one is images. Part two is your resume, your CV. Sometimes they ask for a specific number of pages. I, I do a lot of jobs where they just want a one page resume. So you just gotta like, you know, put everything in a solid one, one page, really small font. Uh, if they don't list the number of pages, you can make it as long as you want. Um, I'll talk a little bit about the resume. You know, everyone has a different situation based on how much work they've done previously. Uh, put everything, put your gallery shows, any public work that you have, any education that you have, any awards that you've gotten, uh, any teaching that you've done, anything related to art in any way, put that down. Letter of interest. Sometimes these are called statement of interest, cover letter, artist statement. It's not really an artist statement, but sometimes they, they, they call it that. Um, what this is, is usually a one page letter introducing yourself Usually the first paragraph, I talk about what my style is. The second paragraph, I briefly summarize um, some of my past experience. And then the third paragraph, I, I go into the project and I talk about the city that the project is in and what I want to do. So it's kind of a narrative description. Everyone handles this differently, but basically a letter of interest it's not just about your interest in the project, it's about you, because they're reading 100 of these, so they, they wanna know who you are and what separates you from every, everybody else. So give them a reason to wanna call you. Uh, number four is a budget. Now, they don't always ask for this, but sometimes they do in the proposal stage, they ask for a budget. When I first started doing budgets, I thought it was like a really, um, bizarre thing that they wanted to know, like every brand of paint that you're buying and every brush and stuff. But now that I've been doing this for a long time, I kind of get it. Like they don't care if you buy this brand versus that brand. What they care about is knowing that you know how to manage money. Because whether someone's spending $500 on you or $5 million on you, they're spending their hard earned money on art and they just want to be confident in your ability to spend that money wisely. Um, so if someone has a weird budget where they're spending like $5,000 per 
on a scissor lift for a week, that's gonna cause a red flag because a scissor lift does not cost that much money. And if you don't know how much money something costs, you gotta do the research. So it does take a little bit of time to get a good budget. Um, a timeline, it's the same thing. They just wanna know that you know how to manage time. Now timelines always change, right? So the, the RFP or the RFQ might say, this project is starting in March and it's not gonna start till March of the next year or till December or something. You never know. So just put a timeline down to the best of your knowledge. And then I always say to my timeline, all dates are subject to change based on the desires of the committee or um, whoever is deciding, right? So let them know that you're flexible, but it's gonna take this amount of time and this is your, this is your plan. So some, sometimes I don't even put dates for the timeline. I just say like, week one, I'm gonna do this. Week two, I'm gonna do this. Week three, I'm gonna do this. Week four, varnish, it's finished, computer, uh, community celebration, done. Uh, concept, um, usually I keep this to like one or two paragraphs. I like to keep it simple. Um, just briefly talk about what you intend to do. Uh, community engagement. So sometimes people have specific community engagements that they want you to do, and sometimes they don't know, but they just say, we want you to have a community engagement uh, component to your proposal. So be prepared for anything. Be prepared to invent a community engagement all on, on your own, and then have that rejected, and then have them tell you what to do later, and be prepared to kind of fit into what community engagement that they already have set. But Community engagements range from like, uh, like, like teaching or uh, interacting with the community, hiring people to be your helpers, having people volunteer to be your helpers. Like there's so much, um, there's so many uh, opportunities for community engagement and everybody kind of wants something different. So just, just really be open to that. But that's a part of mural making. So um, you, you have to be aware of all the different things um, that you're gonna do. All right. So let's talk about proposals. Um, and this goes for like a, a request for a proposal or if you put on a short list. Now a short list is when you submit your RFQ and they choose you, you're usually one of five, sometimes one of six, and they choose you to make a proposal. Usually they pay you uh, some money to do the proposal. But whatever it is, I'm gonna talk about the best way to do a proposal, to do the actual mural design and creation. So step one, look at a bunch of murals. It's very important to know what has been done before. Look at all the most famous artists that you could just Google, like J.R., Roa, Shepard Perry, like look at everything. And if there's any murals in your community, go visit those and look at them and study them and touch them and just be a part of this whole world. And think about the, the ideas. What made this is Keith Haring? This is famous uh, from like the 80s. Um, what, what makes this such a good image that people have talked about it for like 40 years, right? Think about the magic that every one of these murals has and think about what you like and how you can incorporate some of that magic into your own practice. Um, but you, you have to love murals in order to be able to create murals. So step one, look at a bunch of stuff. Step two, research the area where the mural is going to be. Think about the people. Who are the people? Who live there? What do they do? What is the most common job in the area? Um, what types of buildings are in the area? What's the architecture like? Is there like this old school architecture from the 40s or 50s? Or does it have like a certain like dome shape at the top of the building? Like what kind of buildings are there? What kind of trees are there? What kind of weather? What kind of birds? What kind of flora and fauna? Think about everything, every little detail about the area. What's the history of the area? Um, are there any famous people or events from the area? Uh, what pop, uh, pop culture is kind of uh, relevant in the area or centered around the area? 
And are there any urban legends? Is there any like weird mysticism or anything that you might be inspired by? But do a lot of research. I like YouTube videos too. When I do research, I love YouTube videos because um, it's visual and sometimes you hear like a narrative like people are talking, people are like driving around the city um, and it's a really good way to get a sense of, of how the community feels. Like if there's some uh, good YouTube videos out there. All right, step three. Learn about the actual building or bridge or whatever it is, the actual site where the mural is gonna be. Um, if this building or bridge has any history, if there's a business there, what are the surrounding businesses? Who are the people who live, work, or hang out there? And what is the wall surface like? Like you really gotta think about the building. Is the wall stucco? Is it something that has like deep crevices? Um, because that's gonna be a part of your design too. Is it a brick building? Like bricks, you can't paint over bricks. I mean, you can paint on top of them, but you're still gonna see that pattern. So remember that that pattern is going to be there and maybe incorporate that into your design, or at least be aware of it when you're making your design. So think about the site, very important. Step four, write a list of potential ideas. Um, what do you wanna see on this wall? What aspects of your personal work would look good when enlarged to a massive scale. Maybe in your studio, like I, I love perspective. Maybe I'm working on this new weird perspective grid and I'm really passionate about it right now. And it's like, okay, is there any way that this would look good, like massive? Think about that. Um, do you have any personal connection to the area, to the people, to the businesses, the vibe of the area? Think about diversity. Does your mural speak to all of the community? Uh, when I say diversity, I'm not just talking about people, I'm talking about activities too. Like maybe you want to paint people in your mural that are um, skateboarding or, or driving certain types of cars or riding certain, certain types of, of uh, bikes. Put as much diversity into your mural as possible that speaks to the community. So it's not just a limited uh, view, uh, viewpoint. Like you, you, you want it to be re relatable to everyone that's All right, step five, do some rough sketches. Now, I do this thing I call scribble sketching, where I literally, it's just a pure, like, free consciousness, scribble as quickly as you can. I feel like it's important because it gets your raw ideas out of your head as quickly as possible before your consciousness has time to filter them and make them easier to understand. So just scribble it up. It's not gonna look good, but it doesn't matter because you can just do it again. So scribble, 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 scribble. Um, do some rough sketches, decide on a few potential designs, and then when you have a few good designs, make better sketches of those designs. Start narrowing it down and then building it up. Make more complete sketches. Once you have a good sketch that you're excited about, um, now it's time to take some reference photos. That's very important. Do not use photos from the internet because you could get in trouble with that. Uh, you gotta take your own photos. Now, I say that with a grain of salt because people do use photos on, they find online all the time, and sometimes it's fine, uh, but definitely with faces, it's not, um, it's not usually good to, to do that. I mean, your, your mural is probably gonna be up for a long time, and that whole time, let's say your, murals, your mural is up for 30 years, that's 30 years that you have to worry about someone recognizing an image that you stole and suing you. So don't do that, that's, that's not a good life to live. So just, just take your own photos. And it's actually easier than you think. Most friends, family, people that you know would be excited to be in a mural. Um, even if they don't have the look that you're looking for, you can still use them and then collage it with other things. Um, so use your friends as models, get any additional models as needed. Uh, there's this site that I use called Sketchfab Dot com. Sometimes you cannot take your own photos. Um, like let's say you're doing, uh, you know, astronauts and spaceships. Like you, you can't just go out and take a photo of a spaceship. So um, you can Google image search that, and it is okay to use some found images, but you just have to significantly alter the images um, so that they're not rec recognizable. 
Uh, Sketchfab.com is cool because it's like, they have these free samples, so you can type in anything that, that you're looking for, and, and you can see a free sample of like a digital version of this image, and then you can move it around, so you can get the exact perspective that you're looking for, and you can change the lighting, and you can change the size, so it's kind of a cool site. Try it out, sketchfab.com, just type in some random stuff, and see if you can play around with it and find the right perspective that you're looking for. Okay. That's one of my Photoshop collages. That's what I did for Art Supply Warehouse. I did take all those photos myself for the pigeons. How do you? Uh, how did I do it, you ask? Well, I, I got some birdseed, and I got my cell phone camera, and I recorded the video. I put it on the ground, and I threw some birdseed there, and the pigeons literally just flew in and ate the birdseed. And then when I watched the video back, I had the most beautiful footage of these birds just flying. And of course, I slowed it down, and then I took some screenshots of it. But uh, yeah, I'm super into those photos. <laughs> uh, I ended up doing a few murals like this, uh, some were about seagulls, uh, but yeah, it was the same thing. You just take your phone and you throw some birdseed on it and you get some amazing, amazing shots. Uh, yeah, that's Laguna Beach. There's some uh, seagulls there. With seagulls, you gotta use bread. They don't really like birdseed. <laughs> they love bread and they're vicious, so yeah. Was fun. But yeah, I took all those photos my, myself, just, you know, uh, friends I used as models and then birds. And then I, I went around the city and I took photos of like, a, um, like the lighting that they have, the trash can, uh, um, and an umbrella. But yeah, it's not too hard to take your own photos. You just gotta put the, put the time into it. That was for the uh, Laguna Beach High School. And they had a very specific thing that they wanted, like they wanted all of these groups to be rep, uh, represented like the science club, the art club, the swimming club. So I had to go there and just, you know, take a bunch of photos of everybody that they wanted to throw into the mural. Uh, this is my idea um, of a bunch of kids at the beach, like looking in a hole and seeing something mysterious and we don't know what they're seeing, but we see this like weird light like reflecting on their face. Um, but then the adults are walking by and they don't, they don't see it. <laughs> Got the Photoshop collage for that. And uh, yeah, I didn't know any kids at the time because uh, I didn't have kids, I have a kid now, but I didn't then. So I just called my friends that I knew had kids and and uh, yeah, the parents were real excited to have their kids uh, be, in the, be in the room. All right, now step five, and this I'll show you at the end of the presentation. You don't have to do this, not everybody does this, but do a painting study. Um, that's what I did for Wilmington. This is me uh, doing a painting study for a mural, uh, sorry, a tunnel mural in Toledo, Ohio. Um, and I actually, like this is an oil painting and then the wall had these things coming out, these advertisements, but I, I built the entire like mock-up of the tunnel so I could experience the mural myself like in small scale and figure out how the left and the right side interact with each other. So for me, that was really, really helpful. Um, this one I'll show you at the end, but this is for Salinas. Um, it's a painting study. Um, I've only done one wall, but yeah, I'll, I'll enroll that later. So you all can check it out if you're interested. Um, step eight, paint the mural. Um, basically the same stuff that, uh, that you guys said, but you gotta get a good plan. You gotta get calendars, you gotta get lists, you gotta, Sometimes pre-mix your colors, it'll save time, but stick to a plan. When you paint the mural, it's not about being artsy and changing stuff around. Sometimes it is, but usually it's about just getting the job done, having a really set plan, you know exactly what you're gonna do, and you make it happen. Safety, please remember safety. Uh, there's heat, there's bad weather, there's floods. I painted in the snow and it gets really slippery, you're on a scissor lift. Uh, Las Vegas, oh my gosh, I, it was like 105 degrees. We had to paint at night, um, so we would sleep all day and paint all night because the sun was just like beating down on us. And then all of a sudden there'd be these random flash floods and then there was a lightning storm and we were, we were around these like metal, it was a construction site, so these like metal poles were sticking out of the ground, which are like high conductors of electricity. And we're just like, this is not good, this, this sucks. So we ended up like hiding for a few hours. Um, 
in this building until the lightning storm stops. But remember your, remember your health, remember your safety. Um, it, it's easy to get so lost in what you're doing as an artist that you kind of forget that you're physically standing on a really high ladder and it's slippery. Um, so just always be aware of that. Dangerous grounds, dangerous wall conditions, dangerous people. Um, be aware of your surroundings, like who's around and you know, if, if people are not uh, happy about you being there, just, just like fig figure out why and figure out what to, what to, do, uh, what to do about it. Uh, and then crowds, when you're painting, a lot of people are gonna come by and talk to you. And it's my personal philosophy to always be cool with everyone, no matter how bad of a mood that you're in. Sometimes like the weather could be really harsh, and maybe you didn't sleep and you've been working for days and days and days. It doesn't matter. Because think of it from their point of view. A lot of, a lot of people that come up to you have never seen a muralist painting before. And this is the only time that they're ever gonna get to see that. So if you're rude to those people, it, it not only reflects bad on you, but it reflects bad on the entire mural community. So please be cool with everyone that, that you meet. Um, get a good speaker. You gotta have music. Definitely. You can't paint for like 10 hours without music. It's not cool. Um, and then little things like a water supply. Where's the, where's the, the faucet? Um, if there's no faucet, then you gotta get like a five gallon bucket from Home Depot and bring your own water. Is there electricity? You're gonna need electricity if you paint at night or if you use a projector at night. But is there an electrical outlet somewhere? And if not, is there a building that might be able to let you run an extension cord into, into their building so you can use it when they're not in operation? Or is there an electrical outlet that's really far away and you, you have to just go buy like a 50 foot extension cord to make it work? So figure out your electricity. A tape test. A tape test is where you go to the wall that you're about to paint and you put some uh, duct tape on there and then you rip it off and you see if the paint comes off with it. Because if that happens, what that means is the paint that's on there currently is not adhering to the wall properly. And that's bad for you. Because you can paint in the most uh, safe archival way and still your mural is gonna peel off the wall because the original paint that's on there was not done properly. You have to make sure the paint that's on there is adhering properly. If not, you gotta sandblast the wall and start from scratch. You gotta get everything off and get it down to the bare concrete and then make sure that you do lots of primer to make it good to paint on. The tape test is very important. Uh, now when I say put duct tape on it and rip it off, um, you don't have to rip it off that hard if it's duct tape. I, I mean, but yeah, just, there's kind of a fine line between pulling too slow and pulling too fast, but just, it's important to do a tape test. Uh, the Laguna Beach High School, they had this primer on it, and they're like, oh yeah, it's fresh primer, um, it's good, but someone had painted it with an oil-based primer before that, and then oil and water don't mix. So if anybody uses oil, um, you cannot paint on top of it with acrylic paint. So I, I did like the first coat and, and the paint just peeled right off. And I'm like, oh my God. So we had to sandblast the wall. It was, it was terrible. Sometimes building managers and stuff, they don't know what happened before, like before they started working there. Maybe 10 years ago, someone used the oil-based primer. So a tape test is the best way to figure that out. And then always pressure wash your wall. Even if you do the tape test and it's good, and the paint is adhering fine, there is still gunk on there from cars, from smog, from everything. So you gotta pressure wash the wall. It's an extra step, but you go to Home Depot, you rent a pressure washer, and you just spray everything off. It's great. You can't just use like a hose. I used to think that you could. A hose and rags, it just doesn't work. You gotta use a high quality pressure washer before you start painting. Uh, some shots. This mural uh, was done on a wood surface. Sometimes I, I paint a mural on like a, another surface and I adhere it to the wall. This was done on wood um, for Laguna College and I had some students help me. And here's the mural I'm gonna do up here. Um, here's a proposal that I did. Um, I have a PowerPoint, so the concept uh, this is actually a little bit longer than most of my concepts, but 
but this mural focuses on local businesses, community members, and farm workers of Salinas. Uh, it's going to be painted photorealistically with the illusion of 3D depth and extreme perspective angles. Larger than life characters appear to fly off the wall to create an immersive cinematic experience. Intricate details, um, lots of hidden gems. Uh, so here's my design for the, uh, uh, the freeway underpass here. This is like the entire image. So one wall is going to be a farm and the other one's going to be uh, like downtown businesses. But everything is from this extreme worm's eye view. So it's like you're seeing underneath looking up and there's no ground. So the ground is transparent. So that's why people are like walking over you. And in this field, it kind of goes from lettuce over to strawberries. Um, but it's supposed to just represent a, a, a farm that you're seeing from underneath looking up. So you can see like the perspective underground and the same thing's happening in the community here. Uh, I always do this too, like um, if they give you uh, like the architectural plans of the building or in this case the, the freeway, you take your image and you Photoshop it into those plans. Uh, it's just helpful for people to see. Uh, and then this one I did extra descriptions about both walls and I put some detailed shots. Also keep in mind that sometimes when people look at your images, they're gonna look at it like on a projector that doesn't actually show like the full resolution or it's not saturated enough. So, so give them as many details as they let you. Sometimes people don't let you give them de de details. Like there's like a maximum of 10 images or something. But uh, for, for this case, I, I was on a short list and I got to do a proposal. Um, and I was allowed to, my proposal to as many details as I wanted to. So I like doing that extra stuff. And then this is another extra stuff that I do. I, I just printed everything out. For this proposal, I didn't have time to paint a mock up. Uh, I ended up painting it after um, I got the proposal just for me, but I, I took the Photoshop collages and I printed those out and I put cardboard behind it and I, I wanted to show the committee how the mural is gonna look, um, where the images wrap around, because for this design it's very important that like this finger is right on the edge there and there's those L-shaped things that, um, that for me really make the piece exciting. So I, I, I wanted to make sure that they saw what I saw and the potential of this L-shaped design. Then I even talked about it. The 90 degree angle of two perpendicular walls will cause the mural to shift with the viewer, creating a more immersive 3D experience. And here's the other side. And this, this is a pretty easy step, but I would recommend doing it um, because it just shows people what your stuff's gonna look like if it's, if it's actually three-dimensional. Especially if there's like an L shape, if there's like a 90 degree angle or some kind of weird angles on the building, make a little uh, mock up of the building. And then I explain my perspective thing. Uh, so it's like this is a typical vanishing point, the horizon line, and you're looking off into the distance, right? Um, so mine, the campus is up here, right? So you don't actually see the vanishing point, it's underneath, but it's like the. Uh, yeah, <laughs> you're, you're looking underground. Um, sometimes people ask for experience, whatever experience that, that you have, just sum it all up. Uh, I talked about different murals that I've done, uh, different shapes and sizes. I've used all types of ladders, scissor lifts, boom lifts. If you don't have that much experience, that's fine. You can just sum up whatever experience that you that, that you have into a paragraph or something. And not everybody asks to see your experience list like this. Uh, but it, it's good to have it in case people ask for it. And then a material description, uh, talk about what materials that you're going to use. Always use really good paint. Don't use cheap paint. I don't use any house paint because house paint has a, a life of like five to six years, I think. I, I use Nova Color, which I think is the best company. They're out of Culver City. Almost every professional muralist that I know uses Nova Color. Um, it's great and it's actually surprisingly cheap. 
it's the best mural paint and it's not that expensive. So please look into Nova Color. Um, you have to pay a shipping fee for them to ship it up here. I'm lucky I live close enough to Culver City that I can just drive down and pick it up. But it's totally worth it. Nova, Nova Color is great. Uh, don't forget about a, to a top coat. You have to varnish your mural. If you don't varnish it, it's going to fade fast, like it'll fade in a couple years. Um, and then when necessary, do an anti-graffiti coat. Uh, if you live in an area where there is a lot of tagging, you gotta do an anti-graffiti coat, so it protects your mural. Uh, I use this stuff, it's called, uh, it's by Rain Guard. Uh, a mural shield, but yeah, it's a, it's an isofreely urethane resin, but it's, it's really, really good stuff. It basically creates this, this resin um, on top to protect your mural. And if someone does tag it, you can just wash the graffiti out pretty easily. Um, and then, uh, yeah, I usually throw up a closing statement there. I'm down to attend any meetings as necessary. Um, you know, just a friendly ending to your proposal, just so people know that you're, um, that you can be contacted and reached and you're open to uh, change stuff and work with people. Thank you very much for your consideration. But yeah, oh yeah, and then just shameless self-promotion. Always promote yourself. And that's my Instagram right there, Timothy Robert Smith. Um, yeah, thank you very much. textures you can use that if, if it's like a rough like marble texture or just stucco but there are some reference points that you, you can use in sacramento i did a, a project where we used tape because we were it was a red brick building abc 10 building and uh, we wanted to leave the red brick as well so we just did figures we did clear coat but 
instead of painting on the wall, let's say you make markings on the wall, take a picture of the wall, relay the image digitally, and then lower the opacity to make it look transparent. That's a perfect reference, but we didn't want to paint on the wall and do the chicken scratch or the, the characters on the wall, so we used a masking tape. So you, you can use that as a reference points. A bunch of little pieces of masking tape on the wall, take a picture of that, and use that as a reference. That's another method because we want to leave the, the red brick reveal on the wall. As a, as a team though, uh, we find mostly that we just kind of go like old school status where we just have one person designated to doing the outline while the rest of us are, are in the background uh, kind of guiding the person because it's just easier to have one person on the wall instead of five. So we usually have one person, the rest of us are in the back, we're just like, this needs to be moved down a little, this needs to be a little bigger, this needs to be, and that's usually how we go about it, but there's different ways of doing it. It's just the way we do it. No, we just we, we usually just freehand stuff, um, but that's 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 just the method. Yeah, I I've been doing meals for a long time, so I when I first started, I used the grid method. Uh, I would like he was talking about put tape up, and I would put a two scale drawing down and put lines on the drawing and make the grid on the drawing, and then I would use the tape on the wall at the same at a larger scale, but same. Uh, dimension, and then I would break the mural down into those little squares and start doing it that way. And that's how I started, you know. but over the years I've just gotten so used to it and I can literally visualize it. You know. Like on the mural that we did in Sand City, I just jumped on the scissor hooks and started straight uh, outlining everything and they would just stand in the background and just go, hey, no, it's too big, no, it's too small, and it was good to like, get that. I've never had that before, so it's cool to work with a team and be able to like get that perspective. And I assume the same process works. Like, you know, if you're painting something up there, you can't just step back and yeah. see how it looks. So you can climb up and down the scaffold, but you know how that goes. Yeah. So you know, so somebody would be down here saying more of this, more of that. But eventually, it would be nice to invest in a projector, and a lot of people, a lot of muralists, just get like this really good projector and project at night. The outline, uh, so you kind of get distortion. Yeah. Not if it's at a perfect angle. Um, and then some projectors you could account for the distortion. So if you have to do it at an angle, uh, the projector will allow for that. Uh, it, it like uh, it accommodates and like dwarfs the image for you. But I, I try to just do like just a straight on um, angle. I, I use a projector now. I, I used to do like freehand stuff, but. Now when I like try to get super re realistic, like a projector helps so so much. So um, yeah, for like a for like underpass, I'll just be on the other side of the street, just project across. I'll do it in like maybe four different sections. Maybe you yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Um, about how much like what's the average amount of time from the time you start like laying out a grid? depending on if it's one person working on it, as opposed to a team. Also, the size of the wall is very telling, the, the surface of the wall. Uh, but you really, I mean, I don't know. Yeah, most of our walls have been like probably two to three days. We did like a Papa Chama's on Alvarado Street. That was a three to four day uh, mural. Oh. Um, the La Catrina's a new restaurant in Santa Cruz. That one's a two day mural. Yeah, it's great. Um, and we just kind of spread out in the restaurant just to do different figures. And then uh, the counterpoint coffee was a three-day mural. We have a, it's a surrealist Salvador Dali. We call it Project Caterpillar. That was a three-day as well. So that's it's just, being on awesome. the Yeah, it just yeah. varies. It's the environment too, because with the Alsa one, that's like an underpass, so there's going to be cars passing by, pedestrians. So you have to take account of that as well. Um, I think it, this is probably going to be our longest. Two to three weeks. I think it's good to always give yourself that buffer time because yeah. there's always yeah. going to be things that you have to deal with that you didn't anticipate. So if you think it's going to take you two weeks, then you should probably give yourself three to four weeks just to give you that extra time. I'm, I'm super slow. Like I take a couple months to do stuff. 
This one I think it'll take two months, but I, I said three just to give myself that extra time because uh, I just want to, you know, just go over things again and again and again, and so I'm happy with it. Um, but yeah. Yeah, I did a 150 foot mural in Sacramento, and that was about two two months. Yeah, there were two oh. meters doing our cell. It was multiple steps. We need, uh, we had to prime it. We needed two clear coats on that brick, and then and then you're filling the figures with roll on. So that's that was one week there. Uh, so yeah, it just depends on the size of the wall for sure. This one in the back there, please. How do you guys handle design by committee? <laughs> so yeah, so we we all basically. A lot of screaming. <laughs> that's a shout match. Right? Oh, okay. So a lot of nonprofits usually have a group of anywhere from three to seven people uh, that come in and make the decisions. Sometimes there's a ring leader, sometimes it's the entire committee that has input. And then there's the little old lady from nowhere that comes up and tries to take the Great question. Great question. Okay. We'll let you know when we figure it out. Uh, <laughs> yeah. How we start like the, the initial phase of us either sitting down together, like where we found it worked best for us is when we sit down and we put a bunch of paper out in front of us and we all just start drawing, just getting our ideas down. And then it usually, it, it comes down to one person kind of taking the lead and, and seeing everyone's ideas and being able to put it all together. And we'll have that initial phase where it's like, okay, if we got our ideas all down, now, you know, one of us will go and just put all the ideas together, get an initial, just like, okay, let's look at this. And then we'll have another session where, okay, now that we have that, let's start thinking of color, let's start thinking of comp composition, let's try and put it all together. And that's where the kind of shouting match comes in, where we're just like figuring out. But with respect out. to your question with the committee, we really, from our experience, we haven't had much pushback from the client to where, oh, they're making a lot of changes. Like, they pretty much go with, with, with the artist's uh, his vision. Because we we do a lot of research and to know what they want, you know, initially. So, yeah. I think with one thing with having five heads in it, we cover a lot of things that maybe not one artist can think about. So, like having five different creative minds, we really go through a gamut of different ideas, and then we come down to something that we all like, which I think really shows in our work as far as with the client. The client sees that we put a lot of time. In a lot of different perspectives in our pieces, so I think that helps. And this is a state project, so they, there were a lot of requirements, you know, things they couldn't do, like text and specific pictures and logos. And so we already have that in mind. Yeah. We're okay, we already know we're not, we're not getting to delve, delve in that. Just know that if we work with the government, we'll be a lot more effective. Well, I just had a question on uh, budgeting and you talk about three months, but maybe it only takes two months, and you base your pricing on a uh, square footage. So how does that work? Because let's say it's all, it doesn't only take you two months, but you budget it for three, so how, how does that work? I don't, uh, personally, I don't base my price on square footage, because it's like there's so many different jobs out there. I look at all the factors. Uh, like I, um, I would do a job for like super cheap or even free if it was good pub if it was good publicity and if it was something that I wanted to do and I had complete creative control over it. So it's like I just look at all the factors and I, I try to think about what is the best solution to make something happen and and like what you guys said, if it's a project that I really want to do or if I don't the deciding factor. But yeah, I, I don't I don't have like a set rule of uh, I have to get paid this much for square footage. A, a lot of a lot of murals do, but I found that complicates things more because it's already so complicated. There's so many different factors. We just have that baseline. I mean, we've done a few free murals, like the break room, for example, in Pacific Grove on my house. Um, that was they paid for the materials as well as the counterpoint. We wanted at that time we maybe had only three murals, so we wanted a portfolio. So we we said, okay, yeah, we pay for the materials, and we'll just we'll, and and we have creative freedom, so we can just we have free range. And that, that's beneficial. So that's just a baseline on for a particular project. Every project is different. Uh, could be indoor, could be indoor. 
it gives it gives people an idea almost because you know how do you price a mural when you don't even know the concept when you don't know what how much time you're going to be putting i mean we put so much work before we even do the the mural itself so uh, i think that the square footage for us is mostly just from like people first stumble upon us like on our website or whatever they don't want to sell ourselves short they kind of have an idea of yeah. like oh okay this is how much murals go for sort of but it, it really does change based on the project yeah it's just a baseline for people who don't know how to price a mural basically oh square footage that i mean i don't know what that means i'm gonna know i don't know what a square i don't know what a square foot looks like but it's most people are like oh okay i can figure that out So you were talking a lot about safety, which I thought was really important, and I'm glad that you covered that. So being familiar with this site, these, these pieces that are actually on the freeway, yeah. where it goes around, that ground is like this, and it's not really stable. I'm curious how you're going, you know, how do you get to places that are really kind of dangerous? I mean, are you going to have to come with a scaffold down from that over? No, I'm not going to use any scaffolding. I, I think for the um, for the ramp, I'll, I'll just have good boots, and, and maybe I'll put like a uh, like a stake up at the top, and then I could put uh, ropes, like like some sort of harness. Yeah. Um, I know Caltrans is going to have their own re requirements for safety about what we have to do, yeah. but yeah, I was so, curious. Yeah, uh, which I haven't heard about yet, like the specifics. But my envision is that some kind of a harness that you could like use to like pull yourself up. Yeah. Um, yeah, when the, when the ground is really angled like that, it, it gets yeah, kind of tricky. I was curious tricky. about how to do that, because it's like yeah. 14 feet high right here. Too. Yeah. And there's cherry pickers and boomless that they can set in the streets. So yeah. You can okay. stand the basket. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. 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 It's at weird angle. Yeah. yeah, so you just extend the basket over. Oh, cool. Yeah, the cherry picker on the street. 